everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Jackson. I am the active transportation planner for the Prince George's County Planning Department. And why don't we go through with a round of introductions um, to start off? And why don't we start with our two presenters? Um, Irv, take it away. Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Irv Becker. I'm chief of our Highway and Bridge Design Division here in the Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation. And I'll turn it over to Tiffany Jennings to introduce herself. Thank you, Irv. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tiffany Williams Jennings. I am also in the Office of Engineering and Project Management with the Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation. I am the uh, Countywide Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Manager. And um, folks, feel free to, to jump in. I'll, I'll jump in. Hi, uh, Vic Weisberg, uh, Major Project Manager and Special Assistant to the Director, Office of Director. And I will turn the mic over to Samarita. Um, hello, everyone. This is Samirita. I'm the Vision Zero Program Manager at Prince George's County's DPWNT. And Thank I'm you. Stephanie Walder from the Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation, the Highway Bridge Design Division. Um, good evening. Good evening. Hi, Steph, would you like to introduce yourself? Let's see, see your face there. Sure, Seth Grimes with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Thank you. And Callie, how are you? Good evening. I'm Callie Krampos here with the Capital Trails Coalition. Thank you, Callie. Uh, I see Emma Jordan uh, from Greenbelt. You're on mute. Hey, Mr. Jordan, did you want to? Yeah, hey, good evening. How you doing? Nice to hear you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Mr. Walmsley. Would you care to introduce yourself, um, Bill Walmsley? And you're on mute. OK, yes, I'm Bill Walmsley. I'm a resident of the Seabrook area. Also a member of the um, Solid Waste Advisory Commission for the county and uh, interested in trails and a Moaba member as well. Uh, welcome and thank you for um, for joining us. Um, Bob, how are you? Bob Patton. I'm good. Um, I am the Trail Development Program Manager uh, at the Department of Parks and Recreation, um, the other half of MNCPPC in Prince George's County. And uh, I'd like to introduce two new staff people that we have just hired at the Parks Department, uh, totally focused to uh, uh, help on our trail work and trail projects. Uh, one is Sean Atkins, and uh, the other is Ellen Huffman. Sean, I see your name on the list. I'll let you go next. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, hi, everyone. Yes, I just joined Bob's team. Uh, focused exactly on that trails. Um, I'm not new to the commission. I used to be in community planning, um, but very happy to, you know, work in a role solely focused on trails, trails development. So welcome everyone. Thanks. You're needed. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sean. And um, um, Bob it, is your other colleague here. Ellen, are you on the line? If she's on with a phone number, I don't recognize it. All right, she may not she name may not be on yet or may have uh, had a problem uh, connecting in. Um, so I'll uh, introduce her when she gets on later. Thank you, Bob. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Jeff Good, Lemieux. Thanks. Yeah, Jeff Lemieux from Friends of the Greenbelt East Trail. Uh, and my only news is we're expecting to get those feasibility studies this month. Hmm. Oh, that's good news. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, 
Is there anyone else on the line that hasn't introduced themselves yet? Um, that would McCoy. be me. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Crystal, go ahead. Sorry. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. I am Crystal Saunders Hancock. I'm also working with um, Michael on in the transportation planning section. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, anyone else? Well, uh, without. I live I'm in sorry. Bowie and uh, I'm a member of the Multimodal Access and Public State uh, Places Subcommittee of the uh, Bowie Green Team. We help advise the City of Bowie staff and council on matters of biking and walking. Also a member of WABA amongst other organizations supporting biking. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much. You're a, you're a faithful participant. We appreciate your, uh, your presence. Um, uh, Steve, how are you? Steve Hartig, would you hey, to introduce yourself? Hey, all right. Uh, I'm a resident of Riverdale Park, I'm looking to just get involved and and get my uh, local governments and the powers that be making uh, more active transportation options available to everybody. So that's why I'm here. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, Anderson, uh, Russ, Russ Anderson. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Russ Anderson. I uh, do design of these projects in various capacities uh, in the county and uh, really here to uh, hear what Irv and Tiffany have to say, uh, in addition to yourself and the rest of the panelists. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Um, is there anyone else um, that would care to introduce themselves? Hi, yeah, this is um, Kate Robb. I'm joining my phone tonight. I live in Chillum, so I'm just calling in to learn what you all do. Thanks so much for calling in, um, uh, Kate. Um, a few things are happening in Chillum right now. Um, uh, so uh, thanks a lot once again. Um, anyone else? I'll chime in. Um, Hi, hey, everybody. This is, this is Sarah. Baron, I'm. Uh, um, uh, would the lady um, 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 try once again? And then yeah, the gentleman. Yeah, sorry about that. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we're new residents over in Riverdale Heights and love the Anacostia Tributary Trail. So, have a dream that it will be easier for us to walk and bike over to the parks and trails and curious to hear what the plans are. Welcome to the community. And the gentleman who was speaking. Hi, Michael, and uh, thank you everybody for coming to the meeting this evening. I'm Shulin Li, I work at the traffic group. Uh, through the projects we are doing with the county, we see a lot of attention being pushed, uh, being placed on uh, bike and pedestrian facilities and design our issues. So I'm just here to see what's the new, what's going on right now in the county. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Dan, um, um, Bryn, uh, would you care to introduce yourself? This is Jeff. Maybe he dropped off, but I can introduce him. He's also one of the founders of Friends of the Green Belt East Trail and a Bike Maryland board member, among other things. He just put Thanks something in the chat. He just put something in the chat. I was just getting ready to say Dan said he can't see the video, but he's from Riverdale Park, um, Bike Maryland, and Friends of the Green Belt East Trail. So he's on, but he can't see the video. Thanks, Jeff and Crystal, for uh, pinch hitting. Um, Let's see, um, Elliot, your picture just popped up. You're on mute, would you care to introduce yourself? Hey folks, I'm Elliot Caldwell with the East Coast Greenway Alliance um, here in Daniel Stead, although I join these calls as well sometimes. He's on vacation, but I'm happy to, happy to be involved and CTC board member as well. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, are we missing anyone? 
Actually, I'm just a fly on the wall. This is Balu Abdullah. I'm the webmaster for Prince George's planning. I'm just here for tech support. And Balu, and Balu can... you're more than a fly on the wall. We thank you. You <laughs> are who make us go. So thank you for coming. Uh-huh. Thank you. And Bella, you're a fly who can fix anything that breaks down on this call. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, thanks for sharing. We're um, mm -hmm. we're so glad to have you. We couldn't do this without you. you. Um, anyone else? This is Bong Del Rosario. I'm with the Maryland Department of Disabilities. I'm the director of transportation policy uh, for the department, and I am just here because I love to hear about new uh, bike and pedestrian uh, projects, and I'm also a member of the MBPAC. Thank you, Bong. Um, I think this is your second meeting. Um, it is. <laughs> uh, so um, we're, we're, we're glad that you're a returnee. Thank you. Hi, Anyone everyone. Else? This is Valerie. Yeah, this is Valerie Woodall, um, new associate director for the Anacostia Trails Heritage Area. Um, and I've uh, worked on uh, events like Trolley Trail Day um, in the past. So. Thank you for introducing yourself and, and, and coming. Hi, this is Christopher Lawrence, resident of Fort Washington. New bike riders are just listening for potential new places to ride that are safe. Thank you, Christopher, um, for, for coming all the, um, joining us all the way from uh, representing Fort Washington. No problem. Anyone else? Hi, is this for introductions? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I just joined. Sorry, I'm late. Um, I'm Marta Woldu. I oversee our sustainable transportation program at the Department of Transportation Services at the University of Maryland. So good to be here. Thank you guys for hosting this workshop, work group. Uh, thank you very much, Marta. I have, would love to. Um, talk with you offline about um, some of the work that you're doing and some of the things happening outside the of the campus that um, will affect bicycling and walking. Uh, so glad you could join us. Excellent. Yeah, happy to chat. Anyone else? Well, thank you for um, folks for introducing themselves and attending. Um, um, Irv um, Beckert is our next presenter, and um, he is going to give us an update on the Prince George's County Bicycle and Pedestrian Network um, project. Um, so, Irv, please take it away. Irv, you're Very muted. Good. Very good. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And... Uh, I'll get started. So folks, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting uh, the DPWNT team uh, to this presentation. We're uh, very happy and excited to talk to you uh, about the our department's bike and pedestrian network project. But first off, I just want to thank our county executive, our leadership, Angela Alserbrooks, our agency director, Michael Johnson, uh, the deputy director, Oluse Olubenle, and Kate Mazera, our associate director, for their support on this project. Um, again, this is a, a really exciting project uh, that's been in the works for quite some time, and we're now getting ready to do what I love doing, and that's engineering solutions. Uh, so, just a few quick housekeeping rules. If you have a question, if you wouldn't mind putting it in the chat. So use that chat function, type it in. We'll answer the questions in the order received in the time allowed. I'm sure everybody will have uh, will have a chance to address everybody's questions. But really, if you'd like to uh, have a detailed follow up, uh, we are very happy to meet with you separately. Uh, I'm going to provide my contact information, my project manager's contact information at the end of this, but I'll give you my cell phone for quick reference. Uh, it's 
508-908-9610. And Stephanie Walder is the project manager who will be acting on this project, uh, managing it while uh, the uh, assigned project manager is away on parental leave for about four months, and welcoming his, his new uh, twins into the world. But Stephanie will be uh, carrying the load on this project for about four months. And Stephanie, uh, her cell phone is 240-425-6475. And we'll provide all that information at the very end of the presentation. We'll also send the presentation out to uh, Michael Jackson, who can then distribute it to the attendees and people who couldn't make the meeting. And please, you can spread it far and wide. Um, we're always available uh, to talk. We, we, we do like those more intimate discussions so we can go into the details of our projects. So we get into the heart of your concerns. So once again, if you'd like to enter a question, please use the chat button in Microsoft Teams. That's that little cloud logo at the top left-hand corner of your uh, bar of the dialog box for the meeting. When you click on that, the meeting chat will open up on the right-hand side of the dialog box, and you simply type in your question or comment. And don't forget to hit that little arrow on the bottom right-hand corner. I do that all the time. If you don't hit that arrow, it doesn't get entered into the chat. So what we'll talk about today, uh, it's just a, it's a very simple presentation. Uh, I'll be uh, just discussing the bike pad network plan in general. I'll talk about the selection process and then really what we um, are acting on next, the proposed projects, and then we'll, we'll answer questions in the order received. So uh, the bike and pedestrian network plan, it identifies projects uh, that are intended to address those missing links in the existing uh, pedestrian and bike infrastructure on county and state roadways, uh, which would improve connectivity and safety. Now, the recommended projects uh, implement safety measures, uh, which are components of our Vision Zero Prince George's strategy. and uh, this is the result of a collaboration uh, with many individuals, many teams. Uh, we're very proud to work with uh, this group, with the also with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Uh, we're very proud to work with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, uh, and of course our partners at the state, the Maryland Department of Transportation. State Highway Administration. So uh, we, uh, in coordinating with Park and Planning, uh, there was a desire to understand this vision in terms of the master plan of transportation, which is under development by the by our partners at Park and Planning. Uh, we wanted to also tie it into the bike and ped plan that uh, for the national capital region that's established by the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And we also um, utilized MDOT SHA's Context Sensitive Pedestrian Safety Action Plan. So that really informed what we did. Uh, again, it's a real collaboration uh, between public and private partners and uh, you don't ever do these kind of things alone. And so we that, that's why we're so appreciative of you being here because you were part of this process. So we would select projects um, based upon public input. Uh, this was a very aggressive public uh, input effort. We uh, we performed public outreach for this plan that included uh, during the first year of the pandemic, we did an online survey of the community. We obtained over 1,200 responses where individuals uh, discussed and responded to questions concerning their biking and walking practices in Prince George's County. Uh, the information obtained uh, from the survey was used as background information for our plan. And we did present the plan 
uh, to the public at, at uh, the ATAG meeting. Um, and attendees had an opportunity to come and look map at that time. We also uh, presented it multiple times uh, via the Prince George's County Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Advisory Group at uh, various meetings as the plan was being developed. Um, so during this planning process, we heard a lot of comments. Uh, we reviewed existing bike and pedestrian infrastructure. We analyzed crash data, and this helped us develop project needs. And we used a, a very regimented selection criteria process. We wanted to be really consistent and uh, be very objective in the way projects were selected. Uh, because there are so many needs in the county. It is important to look at what is, is needed in the context of every other uh, bike and pedestrian network need. So we screen the projects using this project prioritization matrix, and uh, we uh, worked with our consultant teams on uh, utilizing as the template the Transportation Research Board's Active Transportation Priority Tool Guidebook. Uh, that was an excellent uh, resource for us. And, uh, and you'll notice um, there are four criteria or categories of criteria, potential demand, safety, connectivity, and equity. Those are four things that we hold here in this department. And uh, I really, really like the potential demand element because so often sidewalk and bike facilities and transit uh, uh, measures for that matter, they're often undervalued and disregarded because it the measures that are often taken are based off of existing demand. And if you keep living in that world of existing demand, You'll never advance any project you, uh, that that speaks to modes outside of the standard vehicular mode. So the potential demand uh, factor was really important in prioritizing roadway segments where everyday bicycling and walking could potentially occur. So we believe that this helps in starting our uh, process of creating a complete connected network to transit facilities and other activity centers. So the result of all this, and this is really what I wanted to focus on. This is what me as, you know, being the nerdy engineer, I really enjoy, and that is delivering projects. You know, as much as planning is, is a vital component of starting this, and it is absolutely critical because what it does is it gives you credibility that the project actually is meaningful, that it's going to deliver something that uh, that really does meet the, the need for the community. Uh, financially, it's a good fit for uh, the county's budget, which is stretched thin, which is challenged, but uh, it allows us to defend uh, the investment, which is gonna be extremely high for this project. So we have developed uh, a story map. We just published the story map to coincide with the beginning of this engineering effort. Uh, the story map uh, was developed some time ago as the project in the, in, in the initial planning phase was underway, but now we've uh, made it public. So this link we will make available, you will be able to click on the presentation link um, and you'll be able to go into and, and look at this web map. So what I'll do now is I'll actually go to that web map. So I'm gonna click on this, uh, that link that takes me right here. And this is a story. Map. This is just a, a beautiful little tool that uh, our friends at Esri that develop ArcGIS Pro uh, and ArcGIS Online, they have, uh, we've been able to leverage that, that tool and create this nice storyline that describes completed projects, uh, describes uh, the comment portion, how uh, and what those comments were, 
uh, the project selection process. And then very importantly, the selected projects. Oh, and by the way, it does have contact information at the back, uh, at the back end. You can now contact myself and my project team. But I would like to focus on our projects. And right now, we have selected uh, 15 projects. Uh, and uh, they cover um, multiple parts of the county. They are highlighted in these kind of fluorescent colors throughout the, the county, you will see them. And they look like these small squiggles, but <laughs> they cover extremely long roadway corridors. As an example, we have Brinkley Road from St. Barnabas all the way to Temple Hill Road. That is a long stretch of road, several miles long. And as an engineer, I know that when I enter into a project and it's uh, several miles in length, um, uh, it can be exceedingly expensive to deliver uh, not just the bike and pedestrian improvements, but all the other amenities that we'd like to attach with them. So these 15 projects that we've identified, uh, we are going to be looking at transformative changes on the roadway corridors. More than just bike and ped facility enhancements, uh, we're going to look at uh, LED street lighting, uh, elimination of travel lanes where it's possible. We will look at, uh, as a result, we're going to have to do uh, some detailed traffic analyses to confirm that if we drop a travel lane that we can defend it. That's a very important and, again, transformative measure. But in relationship to bike and pedestrian facilities, we've got a lot of tools at our disposal. Uh, we'll be looking at barrier separated bike lanes, continental crosswalks, uh, green pavement for bike lanes, a hardened center line that is like a median facility, something that separates the two different travel paths in the roadway. Um, in lane floating bus stops, uh, lane width reductions, a uh, leading pedestrian interval signals and this is work at signals to give pedestrians a chance to cross before vehicles can mid-block crosswalks where it's safe and appropriate and there are many opportunities for doing that also considerations for imposing a no turn on red provision at intersections um, pedestrian hybrid beacons those are uh, fairly substantial that stops vehicles when pedestrians cross. It's a physical and legal stop to the vehicles. Uh, posted speed limit reductions, uh, always looking at opportunities to do those within those corridors. We want to look at protected intersections, uh, and we want to look at rectangular rapid flashing beacons. So those are just some of the measures that we're going to consider. But in order to do that, in order to do that, we are investing as a first measure. We will be looking at these 15 roadway sections and uh, doing an intensive engineering topographic survey. Uh, that means we are going to get every hard feature within the swath of those roadways so that we know what our real limitations are. We want to know where the curb is. We want to know where the water and sewer facilities are. We want to know where the hydrants are, where the utility poles are. So we're going to study the heck out of these roadways, because if you're going to take the next step in design, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to know what's in those right of ways. We're going to do a right of way mosaic where we actually uh, define property corners very precisely. Because quite often, designs and the success of designs, they hinge on sometimes not just feet, but excuse my cat as she walks across the screen. Um, so our surveys tell us where the property lines are and designs, they hinge on the success of where those property lines are. Because if you are one foot away from your 
property line and you've just got a little strip of land there, you don't have enough room to build a sidewalk. That's important to know. However, in many cases, we're going to find circumstances where we've got opportunities to build a multi-use path, to build a more expanded sidewalk, to build a cycle track, to build a buffered, a real buffered bike lane, you know, where you've got hard features protecting the bicyclists. But you need to know where your right-of-way is. That's got to be a known commodity. And then finally, we do, uh, we're going to be doing significant utility designation work where we identify all underground and overhead utilities to know what our uh, real encumbrances are. Because folks, those three things are really what define what you can and cannot do. They, have, they define your opportunities and they, design, and they define your challenges. So we'll be doing that for every single one of these corridors. And again, there are 15 projects identified. We are going to be doing 14 of those. And uh, those projects will be done by three different engineering firms. We're now finalizing our engineering test proposals with them. And we're committed. We're going to spend approximately $4.5 million in engineering just to get us to 30% engineering design. That's what you need to spend in or when you're dealing with these very large, uh, very large corridors on some very wide roadways with a lot of encumbrances on them, whether they be utility related, whether they be property related. So we want to know uh, what we do next. And what I really appreciate about this process, if we're going to spend that much money, we sure as heck better be spending them on corridors that make a difference. And, and that's why this planning analysis was so helpful. You know, me as an engineer, our strengths are in designing and delivering. What we look to a planning team, and this is what our planning team did, and you were part of that, was telling us, where do we go? What do we do next? And, um, and now we have that. So I'll just quickly go through some of these areas with you, just so you have a sense of where we're going to be working, just with that as background. Okay. So, so you'll see, again, uh, this link that we're providing will take you to the story map, and then you can go to the selected projects, which is this web map. And uh, here's a small one. It's, it looks small, but it's still a lengthy section of road that's uh, nearly uh, a mile of roadway, Beltsville Drive, connecting to Calverton Boulevard. And uh, the reason that this was selected, it's it provides connectivity to a community, to a major roadway network, and to our adjacent county, Montgomery County. Montgomery County did some wonderful work on Calverton Boulevard on their side of the county line with multimodal improvements that we hope to complete on our portion of Calverton Boulevard that we could then connect into Beltsville Drive. So that, that made sense to me why that section was selected. Now that's a relatively small segment uh, compared to some of the others that we're looking at, but I just wanted to give you that as one out of 14. And I'll keep saying 14 because you'll notice this says top 15 projects. Well, one of those projects in Langley Park, and I'll go to that next, is in uh, the vicinity of University Boulevard uh, and also, uh, also overlaps our project limits for our Safe Streets and Roads for All grant winning project. So we are doing a project here, one of the sub projects to that grant project. So we will be covering that under a separate project effort. So that's why I say we're doing 14 projects, not 15, but we are doing all 15. It's just the other one is being done under a separate effort under the grant uh, federal aid uh, grant efforts. So in this case, uh, this 
is a community, as you can see for the image uh, imagery here. Oh my goodness, it kind of speaks for itself. A huge amount of multifamily dwelling units, that is apartment housing, a very sizable uh, single family dwelling unit community all around. And then of course, University Boulevard with uh, the massive amount of traffic that that carries and conveys and the shopping centers that are lining both sides of it and the unfortunate circumstance that University Boulevard is the most unsafe roadway corridor in the entire state of Maryland. So anything that the county can do to help contribute to improving safety on our county roadways that can connect and improve upon connectivity with a state facility, we're going to do it. So this is our county roadways here that are tying in, and we will certainly um, put a lot of focus on these roadways, again, in the context of the, of the Safe Streets and Roads for All uh, grant project. So I'll move on to a, an, another corridor. This is, um, I live in Greenbelt, so I'm a little partisan here, so bear with me. But um, this area is just south of Greenbelt, south of Greenbelt National Park. It's in the Lanham Seabrook area. And Good Luck Road is one of our corridors that we'll be attacking. And this is a very good section. This is between Kenilworth Avenue and Greenbelt Road. We're going to do this entire section. We're going to look at what improvements we can do meaningfully. And I expect we are going to spend a substantial amount of construction expenditure effort on, on this roadway, making it safe, because uh, this has really the combination of transit services that need to be better accommodated, has connectivity to ultimately the Purple Line over here in College Park, and Kenilworth Avenue. It has a huge amount of residential development on the north and south sides, has a number of points of interest, uh, schools, churches, just, in a, just a great nexus for, uh, for enhanced bike and pedestrian facilities. And then there's another corridor right in the area, Cipriano Road. Uh, again, a very good corridor as it connects uh, to 450. Uh, that's Annapolis Road up all the way to Maryland 193 at Greenbelt Road. So for very similar reasons, um, Cipriano Road is, is a very beneficial road segment. And then to, to finish this off, a shorter segment to be sure, but still, a critical one in that it connects Lanham Severn Road, another state facility with Good Luck Road, and that's 94th Avenue. So again, all of these roadways came out of this process, um, this selection process. And then we've got Pleasant, Pros uh, excuse me, Prospect Hill Road, pardon me, uh, between Hillmead Road and Maryland 193. And one thing I noticed when we were selecting this and uh, was that this provides, uh, there is a, a segment here on Hillmead Road that then takes you to uh, the wb &A Trail. And what we have an opportunity to on these projects is to always extend the limits when we're that close, why not include it? So more than likely, we'll include engineering efforts along this segment on Hillmead Road to complete that connectivity. And, uh, and that's what comes out of that, this initial engineering phase is that we, we start our engineering, we get, uh, we can then uh, get a sense of is the scope adequate, and then we can add to it in small pieces, but not significant. We do need to stay within our project scope uh, for the most part, but we can always add small segments like this because it's meaningful. Irv. Irv, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but sure, that's, sure, the, that's the Amtrak line. Oh, excuse uh, me. I'm sorry. I'm going the wrong it's, way, aren't I? The WBNA is considerably yeah, WBNA south. Is. Yes, it so sure is. So that's a sir. whole other project. <laughs> it, it, it is indeed. I do apologize. That's Fletcher Town Road, which takes it down there. Yeah. 
your your point well taken because that's down my mockingbird lane. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. So, um, but, but doesn't I'll Fletcher let... Town Road have some bike lanes on it already? It has. It has a shoulder at the connection with Highbridge Road. You you and it connects you to the WVNA, but but. Um, I do want to just state that this segment here, the point that I wanted to make was that we have opportunities to expand on limits when we find that there's like a logical nexus. So, uh, point well taken, Bob. So this, this may not be that opportunity to connect to the WBNA, excuse me, but it may be an opportunity to, to just extend out the tendrils of the project a little bit to get you to some points of interest where uh, where safety needs are, are, are can be met. And that that's the benefit of these type of projects. So once we have survey crews out there, we we can go out a few more hundred feet in either direction. Uh, we can do a bit more research. We do want to think it through uh, before we do that because it is expensive, but but these this is the time to really finesse those engineering scopes. So that this is Prospect Hill Road. I'll move on to the next project. So down in the Forestville region, uh, we're doing a lot of work in this area because Marlboro Pike uh, is while University Boulevard as a state facility is the worst actor, that is, as far as safety, um, the highest number of pedestrian crashes in the state of Maryland. Marlboro Pike, as far as county maintained roadways, is a roadway that has the unfortunate notoriety of having the highest level of pedestrian crashes uh, in that is a county maintained roadway in Prince George's County. So we've been doing multiple efforts here. We're uh, doing three phase projects on Marlboro Pike, but this provides good connection to that. So this project is not on Marlboro Pike, but connecting to it. And this is Donnell Drive. Um, and as you can see, um, heavily commercialized in one sector, heavily residential in the other. And that's really the, the mix similar to what we said about Langley Park that we're trying to to address in in as safe and effective a way as possible to enhance the bike and ped facilities in those corridors to improve uh, the conveyance so it's safer slow people down neck down the roadways look at road diet opportunities look at lane elimination opportunities uh, look at opportunities to change turning radii at intersections. So there's a lot of work that can be done in these roadway corridors that enhance bike and ped safety, and they put them in the right context for these communities. But you need to make sure that you know what your existing conditions are, and that's what we're doing uh, as, as, a, as a first measure. All right, so Iverson Street is uh, another section, uh, a, a good opportunity to uh, to enhance connectivity between Wheeler Road and Owens Road We're on the connection and on the approach to uh, our bordering jurisdiction, Washington, D.C. Uh, and this is just a great opportunity to uh, to enhance a different type of facility here. This is a roadway that uh, suffers from high speed issues, high speed concerns, and uh, and the way you attack that is by looking at the road structure itself and what can we do differently to this road to uh, to improve safety and uh, and also add those bike and pedestrian facilities. And I'll zoom out to our next project, Brinkley Road. Uh, again, this is in the uh, South County area, Temple Hills area. And 
This is a extensive section of roadway that again, similar uh, to Iverson in that it's got a fairly long stretch with minimal access points, which really encourages speeding. And therefore, everything is context sensitive in what we do. We want to improve and provide those kind of bike pad facilities, but we also want to look at what we can do to slow down traffic on these kind of thoroughfares. Allentown Road and Old Branch Avenue. Uh, that's our next big segment that's in green here. Uh, that is again, Clinton, Temple Hills area and Camp Springs. Um, this is an exceedingly wide roadway, uh, but a roadway still constrained by a lot of development on both sides, both commercial and residential. So we're going to be hard pressed to find solutions on Allentown Road, uh, but we will find something. We will do something, whether it's a multi-use path, uh, whether it's it is exceedingly difficult to lose lanes on a roadway like this, but we will look at that as an option. But this is a, a very tough corridor. Um, and uh, we'll be looking at that and, uh, and just considering any and all option. Branch Avenue being uh, an old Branch Avenue, excuse me, old Branch Avenue being a connector to Branch Avenue, Maryland 5, uh, is uh, a roadway that uh, we would like to make sure that it, again, addresses the same kind of speeding and issues and still serves multimodality uh, those multiple modes of transport we've got bus routes that run along this uh this roadway and uh, and and currently the bus shelters uh, the bus stops the bus pullouts are are inadequate they they need to be improved so this is what we would do as one of the considerations on these kind of projects Kirby Road, again, a connector uh, between two major arterials, uh, Old Branch Avenue and Maryland 5 on one side and Temple Hill Road on the other. Um, and as you can see, it is a straight shot. So what do you think is a major issue here? Speeding yet again. And therefore, that will be um, top of our mind when we're looking at this kind of product. Uh, project site. What can we do to enhance and improve safety along that corridor? Again, uh, we're we're constrained. You can see everything's built up more or less around it. We've got a aggregate uh, a concrete facility here that's not going anywhere. We've got um, townhouse and single family dwelling unit developments uh, more or less ultimately built out through this area. So we need to account for what's out there and fit in the very best facilities that we can in that, in that stretch. Then Old Branch Avenue and Brandywine Road, this is a significant section here. Uh, I have to zoom up very far to get the full limits of this. So this is uh, actually two road names. Uh, starts off as Old Branch Avenue at Kirby Road, and then it runs down and it becomes Brandywine Road at the intersection with Woodyard Road. And, and we are going to run this project all the way down to and past Piscataway Road. Uh, and, and we are going to terminate it right at uh, a bridge replacement project that we're um, delivering almost simultaneous to the, what this project will be. Um, and it's a really good point of termination. So we have full control of this right of way. We're going to look at um, many and all options. Now, this is your classic uh, densely suburbanized roadway, high speed that needs to be improved and enhanced for safety. Uh, so many of our roadways, as they grew up over time, the bike and pedestrian facilities did not keep up. So uh, we're going to be uh, determining what we can and cannot do. I think in this case, 
uh, to make this project successful, uh, we'll more than likely have to purchase right of way as we go along this corridor to, to build what we need. And then I did want to talk to uh, the a new Carrollton area. We have one project there. I didn't want to over, overlook that, so bear with me. And in the vicinity of the new Carrollton Metro, uh, the county has a significant raised project that will be enhancing Garden City Drive, providing train station improvements. And really, as a perfect segue to that, we've uh, we've got one corridor on Penzi Drive that'll connect into Garden City Drive. So we'll be looking at connectivity because even though this project may not present itself very well by itself, when you look, why would you care about an area where there's it's primarily industrialized? The reason is it provides a very meaningful connection to the community down in Landover. You really have a, have a point. I'm sorry to jump in here, but also sure. the metro. Of course, which, and the metro. And the metro and the development in New Carrollton that you mentioned. So, yes, so indeed. Those are huge. Yeah, that, that is indeed. And and it's and and these projects, you know, mean something because they they don't just stand on their own. They they really work in support of other elements uh, and other points of connection, like Vic just said, those metro stations are important. And these are communities that are absolutely uh, disadvantaged uh, areas where we do need to to focus on equity to be to bring up these communities and improve and enhance their connectivity. So uh, this this is uh, a really meaningful connection. And, and as uh, Irv noted, that that um, the Landover station is one of the most underutilized metro stations in the system. So it, this kind of improvement is enormous and um uh, you know for all, for all the reasons that are mentioned you know equity and connectivity and and so forth but um it, that does a lot sure does yeah, and thank you Vic. um i I'll, I'll end this by just saying these are this is just a web map that i'm pointing to folks so i i want to have more to offer and we will, but you have to give us time. We have to, and I'm going to now go back to my presentation. We are just initiating the engineering design. And uh, we have three consulting civil engineering firms for these 14 sites. We are distributing the, the workload amongst them. Uh, again, our initial goal is to do intensive survey work. Uh, intensive utility designation work that is identifying all the utilities and intensive right away uh, mosaic work that is identifying all the right of way encumbrances. Once we get those existing conditions plans back, we will then um, complete uh, our, we will complete all of that by early 2025. We will then move very aggressively into preliminary engineering design. That means we will be drawing um, a variety of different design alternatives for each section. We'll be identifying and grouping projects in categories. There will be the low level maintenance implementation projects, which there will be very few of because if there were projects like that within those corridors, we in almost all likelihood would have already done them. Um, but then there's the mid-level capital improvement projects. And these are projects which are smaller scale, where we put in a rapid rectangular flashing beacon, where we put in a, a traffic signal where none exists, or we uh, we upgrade or enhance the way the traffic signal functions. We update it with pedestrian uh, signals. We look at, and potentially a small roundabout, some small traffic calming. So those are mid-level. Those are relatively easy, implementable uh, design elements. And those could be part of the outcome of this project for some of those corridors, 
or parts of those corridors. But many of these corridor projects are going to result in substantial major CIP projects, major capital improvement program projects. And that's where we, we reconstruct the roadway, we acquire right of way, we do something of a, of a very substantive way to, to build improvements that are needed. Um, and that's the beauty of this process. We'll know in early 2025 where we're going with these. We'll know whether we've got the very low level maintenance level fixes, which again, I, I, I feel are far and few between, or the mid-level projects, which again, I, I do think there's some opportunities for that throughout these corridors. And then what I know for certain, there are quite a few of these which will develop into very substantial CIP projects. And this is very important because we have never before seen the level of federal investment, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, available, made available to the county, to the state, to our partners at park and planning, uh, to local, uh, to private stakeholders. And we have been uh, put throwing our hat in the ring and we've been successful uh, with a few applications. We uh, were successful in securing the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant, a uh, very substantial $22 million federal contribution. Uh, we were successful in securing the, uh, the Bridge Investment Program grant. These are planning level grants, but uh, in all likelihood, and I think that we will be securing the implementation grants for uh, for uh, close to $20 million in bridge replacement work. So these kind of efforts beg for engineering. Uh, these kind of grant applications, these grant opportunities don't happen if you don't have a plan. You need a plan. You need to have an actual engineered plan set that's implementable. That's how FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, how they judge our grant applications. Um, so we want to apply for for grants for these corridors, and I think we'll be successful. I, I think we have a very good chance. We've been building an excellent reputation with FHWA with our current grants in the works. Uh, I've got Stephanie Walder, who's um, my project manager on the Safe Streets and Roads for All project, and she's doing a wonderful job in coordinating with FHWA, building that relationship, building that future for success so that we can implement more projects under those grants. Because folks, those corridors that I've just described, they are gonna well exceed the original $15 million estimate that are back of the envelope, earliest planning stage estimates were for those, uh, for those projects. It's, it will exceed that, triple it, double it, quadruple it, however you want to look at it, it is significantly, it will be significantly more. Um, how much? We'll know better in early 2025, but, but we're committed to it. And we will, this allows us to, to uh, advance major projects in these corridors. And uh, I'm so pleased that that I can say we're delivering projects that have been scrutinized by the public, that have been subjected to an objective selection and review process that meet different types of needs depending upon where you are. But in the end, one of the overarching concern that it's meeting is multimodality and safety and connectivity and equity. It's absolutely doing all of that because right. we have the basis of, of project selection. So I just wanted to, and I, I know uh, we, we probably have a few comments and questions, but that's um, what I have on my presentation. Let me make sure, I'm gonna leave this slide on. This one is the contact information. So while we go into questions, I'm going to keep this slide on. It has my contact information, my cell phone, and my email. It has the project manager, Stephanie Walder, who's kindly step, uh, stepping in. 
for the next four months to help manage this project. And then Caleb, he, when he returns from uh, parental leave, will resume management of the project in June. Uh, so this is our contact information. Uh, we're very happy to, to meet with you individually to go through uh, your questions and comments. And and right now, I'll, if if it's OK, yeah. Michael, could I go through the comments that were raised in the chat? Yes, um, if we can take about 15 minutes because we still want to have some time for Tiffany's uh, update on the capital bike share. You got it. Well, um, so can you see the chat questions or would you like them to be I, read to you? I can see. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. OK, so uh, so Seth Grimes uh, asked from Wama. Thank you, Seth. Does the network plan include trail routes through parks? Not this network plan. However, and uh, as Russ Anderson uh, can attest to our projects, they often come very close to parks or trail segments, and we're very happy to build short connections. I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to build 500 linear feet of trails, but we've done it before where we've gone maybe 100, 200 feet out to the next trail uh, as long as park and planning. Normally, they are the, uh, the owner operator of the trail system as long as they're amenable to that. Uh, we're happy to do that uh, because, yeah, we do recognize connectivity is a big piece of this. Thank um, you. Sure. And the next question from uh, Sean Atkins, is it possible to share the selected projects map URL in the chat? Absolutely. So uh, I will put that in the chat in just a moment. And um, Irv, you're good. I'll stop you right there. Um, yeah, no, you're you're totally fine. It was already posted in the chat. Thank you very much to right. David for part that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sarah Johnson asked, this is great stuff. When you get to questions, I will be curious to hear if there are projects you didn't prioritize because needs will be addressed by the purple line construction. Hmm. Good question. Uh, I, it, that's really two parts to that. Number one, uh, purple line being a state initiative focused primarily on the alignment of the purple line, primarily ran through state facilities. It is their responsibility to upgrade those uh, those roadways and the, the requisite pipe bike and ped networks um, uh, that are on their right of way. Uh, and certainly the other part of it is what we were very happy to do. The presence of the Purple Line absolutely led us to project segments. It, it also and continues to lead us to other projects, the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant project. So uh, I wouldn't say we counted it out. We actually included segments because of its proximity. But again, the main corridor, the state routes uh, that we leave to the state, and, and I, I think they are moving forward on, on improving and enhancing bike and ped safety along their corridor. Vic, did you want to chime in regarding that? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, ob obviously, you know, what we can focus on is, you know, what we can do on the county roads. But as Irv correctly noted, we did look at how do we connect to, you know, activity centers, you know, existing projects and Purple Line being, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the most important. Um, and um, there are bike lanes as part of the the Purple Line project on 193. They're not they are not buffered, but but um, we actually we were able to get two feet added onto the striping plan. So there is a painted buffer, but not a not a not a protected um, as we would have liked. But, um, you know, we did what we could. Um, so to answer Herb's question, the answer is yes, we did um, strongly factor in connectivity and connectivity to critical projects like the Purple Line. Okay, very good. Thank you, Vic. And uh, Jeff Lemieux asks, are you planning to put protection features on these projects, such as curb stops and flex posts? Absolutely. Now, so we are looking at options to harden the separation, because I really do feel that uh, that's how you truly protect the other modes. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we strongly feel that that's the way to do it. Flex posts, I would prefer 
uh, monolithic concrete medians. Uh, if I put a flex post, I'm going to put it on an actual median. Um, and that way it's, you've got the visible protrusion vertically, but you also have the hardened separation on the ground. I think the combination of those two works really well. Um, but we'll we'll certainly look at any and all options. And you know, folks, this is why I love these meetings. Uh, and as we move into the engineering process, we're going to hold public outreach efforts. We're going to hold stakeholder reviews, whereby we solicit input. We, you know, we don't have all the answers. You know, we have quite a few, but but we want to hear from you all with your ideas. You know, we're going to hear them, give them their day in court. I'm not going to tell you something just because you want to hear it. I'll say. We'll we'll acknowledge and listen, okay? But but we do believe in in active listening sessions whereby we talk about our projects, we get your ideas, and let's see what we can do. The um, next comment is from Dan Berman. Oh, thank you, Dan. You posted the uh, link. I appreciate that. Uh, and then Melissa uh, says, drivers unfortunately don't stop at the red hybrid beacon. For Northwest Branch Trail, Maryland 500, though some stop when it's yellow. Point well taken. And that's, again, where you have to look at the entire system, look at what other measures can you do to add and enhance that. What I find, those RRFBs, they work well. The pedestrian, uh, when you've got something else around it, slowing the vehicles down, creating that chokehold, uh, that choke, excuse me, in the the net uh, traffic network, you it has to be part of other elements in many cases to be effective. So um, <laughs> I can tell you in the city of Greenbelt where uh, Jeff and I live, um, one of the facets that makes the RRFB work exceedingly well is the fact that it's very near speed cameras. <laughs> okay, so speed cameras slow people down, and and it also then in that context, the placement are, are, of RRFBs really makes sense. But there's other means you can do to slow people down, and we're going to consider all that. Melissa uh, says, never any need to apologize for cats. Oh, very funny. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> yep. These cats have been with us for a while. And uh, Seth asks, is DPI on board? Well, um, they don't, they, well, uh, let me just answer that. They, they are on board with supporting our projects. They are our partners. Uh, and I must say, it's an evolving thing for all of us. You know, I've been a practicing engineer for almost 30 years. And and the way I thought not then is not the way I think now. And, and much can be said for my colleagues at DPI. And I do believe we're all moving in the same direction towards multimodality, towards pedestrian safety focused, transit focused, bike focused um, improvements in the right of way. So yes, DPI is on board, getting more on board, uh, but we are the owner operator, so we really can dictate the terms on what goes on in our right of way. I mean, I, I appreciate DPI's feedback, but in the end, uh, we will uh, determine the uh, the final configuration of our roadway improvements in the public right of way. Um, Jeff asks, just feedback, not a question. I think it's great that DPWT has a list of 14 specific projects to focus on. I think that's super important to have real projects to work on. I couldn't agree more. You know, when we have discussions about uh, complete green streets, when we have discussions about safety enhancements, I always tell my friends, Tell me about your idea in the context of a real project, and then we can talk. And now we've got 14 projects that we can talk about. And that's where you really can think through the various ideas that I'm sure all of you have about improving bike and ped safety. So that these are the opportunities to do that. That's what I really love. It's a, It gives you the chance to talk about these things. And and execute some of those ideas. Next point. I have about five more minutes. Okay, I'll be really quick. Seth, Seth Grimes, is project execution dependent on federal or state funding sources coming through? Okay, um, we're absolutely going to be gunning for a lot of federal funding, but we have a significant uh, commitment for the county. So we are going to be delivering on these projects 
in just what shape and form. We'll have a better idea next year, but we plan to apply for many grants. Hey, Irv, if you don't mind my following that up, uh, WABA is preparing our own Prince George's County FY25 budget advocacy. And if there are points associated with this, or for that matter, other points that you would like to see advocates, community members include in their budget advocacy, please let us know. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Because you know, our budget <laughs> comes from a political entity. So yes. And uh, advocacy uh, from groups such as yours always, always helps. So yeah, let's talk and let's definitely talk about it in the context of these projects. And yes, that's what, yeah, that's what I was going to add is, yeah, is that the, yeah, we can we can talk sort of before you make the official list and you know, have a conversation. Um, our, our and how, how we can tie stuff mind, together. If you, if you don't mind my addressing community members on this call, our advocacy plans do extend to trying to arrange meetings with county council members where we will uh, include their own constituents. And if people would like to participate in that, you should drop me a line. I'll put my email address in the chat. Thank you for the opportunity to pitch that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, and uh, just two more minutes, I know. Uh, so, March to Waldo says, thank you for selecting Langley Park and your work on University Boulevard, such a high stress area. Thank you kindly. Uh, Jeff Lemieux, Good Luck Road is super important because it has uh, safe parkway and beltway crossings. Absolutely concur. Uh, Bob Patton says, very key point, Jeff, thanks. That is Amtrak, not WBNA Trail. Thank you for pointing that out, um, Bob. Uh, Dan Burrand, uh, where, where these projects start and end at the M.SHA maintained road, will there be any opportunities to improve the intersection with MDOT? That is huge. That is something we're absolutely going to talk to the state about. I got to say, sometimes we actually shy away from that on many of our projects because of the difficulty. But here, we're we're going to leave no holds barred. We are going to talk to the state about what we can do with these intersections to improve them and see what's realistic, what's not. I have to respect the state. They are their own owner operator, so they have to be part. They need to tell us what's realistic and what's not. But I absolutely will make that part of the, the project consideration. And then finally, Prospect Hill would provide a great connection to the Greenbelt East Trail, 10-4, also a big church there and new housing and lots of opportunity to help connect to transit and our hopefully future trail on 193. Yes, indeed, Jeff, uh, support that. As a footnote, uh, the Iverson section is also part of a, tran uh, this is from Vic Weisberg, is also part of a transit project to add queue jumps and facilities to enable high capacity transit. Um, folks, we have quite a few other comments, but I want to respect what Michael's asked me to stick to and to give Tiffany Jennings an opportunity to uh, speak about the bike share program. Uh, you've been very patient with me. Folks, if I could ask you, if you'd like to reach out to us and have these questions, could you kindly reach out to me with those questions specific? And it doesn't have to have been posted here, whatever comes to your mind. And uh, what I'd like to do is set up a follow-up with you uh, so we can talk. Uh, just give us time to do that, but reach out to me and we'll take it from there. And with that, Michael, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you so much. You've exceeded my expectations. And um, given the reactions from the audience, I think you have certainly met theirs, if not exceeded. So thank you once again. Oh, hey, thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time. So I'll just listen thank in now. Thank Fifth you, in, you're next. Thank you, Irv and Michael. Michael, we'll figure out a way to get the comments that are in this chat over to Irv. Um, and then if if others also want to um, send additional comments to Irv, but what we'll do is make sure that the comments from the chat get to Irv and Stephanie. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Tiffany, it's all yours. You will give us an update on um, capital bike share in the county. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you, uh, Michael, and excellent presentation to my colleague, Irv. Again, my name is Tiffany Williams Jennings. I work with the Department of Public Works and Transportation as a countywide bicycle and pedestrian 
program manager. I also manage our capital bike share uh, program, handling uh, the operations um, side of capital bike share. And so um, Michael reached out and wanted us to provide a um, an update on what's going on all capital bike share. And so I will do that in five minutes because I know you all are supposed to end at 830 and um, it's 817 and we want to allow time for questions. And so um, just to first provide an overview, I'm assuming all of you all have heard of capital bike share. Uh, Prince George's County actually operates and owns capital bike share along with seven other jurisdictions in the region. And so we're not doing it alone. Um, we are doing it with jurisdictions in Maryland, Washington, DC, and Virginia. The jurisdictions that actually own and operate capital bike share are the District of Columbia, and they actually own more than half of the bike share stations uh, that are in the system. They own over 300 uh, bike share uh, docking stations, but we have docking stations in Washington, D.C., the city of Alexandria, uh, the county of Fairfax, the city of Fairfax, uh, Arlington, Virginia, the city of Falls Church, Prince George's County, of course, and Montgomery County. So there are eight jurisdictions together that own and operate capital bike share, and our vendor is Lyft bikes and scooters. And so we pay Lyft to, to maintain the stations, to rebalance the stations, to uh, if there's graffiti on the docking stations, Lyft handles all of that for all eight of the jurisdictions. And so um, capital bike share is provided um, to the community as an affordable, accessible, sustainable mode of transportation. And um, uh, many individuals use it for the first mile, last mile, um, whether they're um, going to, to work or um, going uh, shopping. Um, some persons use it for recreation, uh, uh, use for various uh, reasons. And so for, for fun, <laughs> some people use it as their mo main mode of transportation. But um, it's definitely um, a, a great way to also work out. And so um, we, again, own 27 of the over 750 docking stations in the system. And our plans are actually to install 28 new stations um, over the next two years, ideally uh, um, sooner rather than later. We have budgeted funding to, um, to install these stations. And so we are excited about plans to, to move forward to increase the number of stations in Prince George's County. Again, all of the, um, the jurisdictions that own and operate Capital Bike Share are looking to um, increase the number of, of stations. And so we also have the e-bikes. Many of you all are familiar with the e-bikes. This is actually the Watson, the one that you see in the middle. This is our older e-bike, but we have um, a new uh, Cosmo that is silver in color. And I'll actually show you that one. That was um, launched in uh, the spring of, of 2023. But with the e-bike, you know, it's a pedal assist. You don't have to work as hard <laughs> when you're when you are biking, the red to the left are our classic, um, our classic bikes. Um, and so um, the last stations that we installed, we installed three stations in um, 2022. Uh, the last three stations were installed in Greenbelt, but we do have plans to install um, over approximately 28 more within the next two two years. And so I wanted to provide for you also two great resources. This is our Capital Bike Share story map that we have um, that was actually uh, created, um, I believe it was last year that we um, launched this story map. Um, but uh, you, with this story map, you can actually zoom in and see live information on the number of uh, bikes that are at each of the stations. 
Um, and then you could also take a look at um, you could take a look at uh, the station if you wanted to see what the station looked like, if you wanted to also um, uh, see how many docks are are empty, how many docks are um, are full. Let's just look at this one at Prince George's Community College here. You could zoom in to this particular um, site and take a look at um, what the station looked like. Um, this was just a, an image of what that station looked like. You can um, um, also see the number of bikes and docking stations, I mean, number of bikes and docks that are available. There, this is a 15 dock station. Um, there are actually 10 bikes presently available. This is live. And so, um, of course, uh, you could also um, see if you wanted to see the street view, which you you actually um, saw the street view. But this is uh, this is also the website if you wanted to go to the website to learn more about Capital Bike Share. Uh, you can find out how it works. You can also obtain pricing information. You can do that from the story map, or you could also do it from. Um, from the actual Capital Bike Share website. Um, prices, this is uh, uh, the great thing about Capital Bike Share. Again, we mentioned that it's affordable. We have a CABI for All program, which provides $5 memberships for persons who qualify. Um, this The site talks about who are eligible for um, the CABI for All program, but if they, um, qualify for SNAP, WIC, uh, TANF, um, and the like, uh, Medicaid assistance, $5 a year is the the, the membership. And um, our rides typically are 45 minutes, but with Cabby for All members, they actually ride 60 minutes um, free. And that includes also e-bike. Um, um, e-bike. So, you know, ride longer than 60 minutes, you pay five cents per minute for Cabby for All. But um, this is, again, just some some information. If you know of anybody who uh, may qualify um, and needs transportation, may qualify for Cabby for All, it is only $5 for, for persons that qualify. Um, we have uh, the system map. Here, in addition to the the um, story map that is operated by Prince George's County DPWNT, the Capital Bike Share system map is um, operated and um, updated and maintained by our vendor Lyft. This, of course, all of the um, member jurisdictions. When I say member jurisdictions, I'm talking about the the eight jurisdictions that I mentioned to you that own and operate. Um, Capital Bike Share. Um, this actually includes uh, data for all eight jurisdictions. Um, and so it talks about the different types of um, memberships that we have on this on this site. You have the system map, you have plans and pricing, you have the ridership experience. And then um, I think we actually have, let me, I think I have a picture of a, yeah, this is our Cosmo bike. If you have not tried the Cosmo, um, um, it's it's an amazing ride. Michael, I believe Michael tried the Cosmo. Michael, did you try the Bike to Work Day? We I did. did have this. <laughs> you did. Yes, yes. We did have the Cosmo at Bike to Work Day, um, and we plan to have them again this year. But it's a sweet ride, uh, really nice. You have to do very little work on on this Cosmo. It does all the work for you, and so we're excited about getting a thousand. Um, new Cosmos in the system. The great thing by being in a system that's not just one jurisdiction, but eight jurisdictions, we all benefit. So um, we plan to buy Prince George's County 30 more Cosmos, or we plan to buy 30 e-bikes, 30 Cosmos um, this year, but DC is buying a thousand. And so those thousands um, of Cosmos will ride through um, the system, all eight jurisdictions. So all of the jurisdictions get to benefit and um, all of the users. So if you get um, a Capital Bike Share membership, um, 
you are able to access bikes, not just in Prince George's County, but in all eight jurisdictions. Um, and um, again, it's connecting you from one area to the to the next area. And so um, that is pretty much, let me go back to my story map real quick because I wanted to provide for you. Um, again, this is the, the site, I can drop it in the, uh, the chat for you, but this is um, the list of information here. We have um, a list of resources, the Capital Bike Share website, um, how it works, pricing information, uh, the equity program, transportation hub, and plan your Capital Bike Share route um, in Google Maps. Um, Google Maps actually recognizes Capital Bike Share, and uh, you can find a Capital Bike Share station using Google Maps. My contact information is here to the left if you have additional questions. But Capital Bike Share, I mean, Capital Bike Share is doing really well. Last year um, was one of our best years. October actually was the highest ridership um, month uh, overall in the system. And again, when I'm talking about uh, ridership, I'm not just talking about in Prince George's County, but system-wide, because there are eight jurisdictions that own and operate um, Capital Bike Share. But we definitely look forward to um, increasing our stations from 27, adding 28 more. That was one of the questions that Michael had. So I wanted to make sure I touched on that. 28 new system, uh, 28 new docking stations are coming online within the next two years. Um, and um, College Park is going to have three of those stations um, that um, actually is going to come online. Um, um, before the end of this year is our, is our goal. And so, um, and again, a thousand new bikes system-wide is our update. Oh, Tiffany, mm -hmm. thank you. I think we have time. Well, let's make time for one question from mm -hmm. Mayor Emmett Jordan of, of Greenbelt, who okay. asks, we've waited for years for the implementation of capital bike share in Greenbelt. We now have three stations but we need a docking station at our metro station to complete the network for Greenbelt College Park area. When can we expect this to happen? Great news, great news, and a great question. Um, the 28 stations that we talk about, um, those are our plan. Greenbelt is one of the stations that will benefit. Greenbelt Metro is one of the stations um, that will be installed. Um, and we're saying within the next two years, which gives us a little, um, uh, more, more room. Our goal is to install it before two years, but we do have funding for that. And um, the Greenbelt Metro Station, as well as the area Hanover Parkway um, near Eleanor Roosevelt High School, that is the, the second station that will be um, the second new station. So there'll be five total in the Greenbelt area. But within the next two years, ideally much sooner than that, we do have funding for it. So it is coming. Thank you so much, Tiffany. You've um, mm -hmm. you've provided more information than I thought you were going to be able to. So uh, in five minutes, actually, it was longer than five minutes. But <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you've exceeded our expectations. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're at eight thirty, eight thirty-one. I just going to make a brief mention that Bike to Work Day will be on Friday, May seventeenth. I put a, um, a link in the chat um, so uh, folks who are interested can register, register and show up and get your T-shirt and uh, bring our numbers up. Um, uh, for the first time, I'll be manning the um, Prince George's County Planning Department's National Harbor Pit Stop. And Tiffany, I believe, will be doing a bang up job as she usually does over at, um, um, per, um, go ahead, Lar Tiffany. Largo Kettering <laughs> Perrywood Community Center. So after you leave Michael's pit stop, come on over to Upper Marlboro, to the Largo Kettering Perrywood Community Center, uh, bike to work day pit stop, get your swag bag and some great LED lights and uh, join us for a fun time. I have Thank one quick question, uh, Michael, if you don't mind. 
Go uh, ahead. Somebody, somebody asked a question for uh, Bob Patton. That was Ken uh, McCaughey, uh, who asked about any updates on the WBNA bridge. I'm curious myself, Bob. Uh, can you give us an update? I can. WBNA bridge has gotten a green light from SHA to, uh, with regard to the issue of the uh, the snafu with buying U.S. steels and certifying it properly. So uh, I was out to the site yesterday, and um, they haven't started building the bridge yet, but they have the go-ahead, and so I think they're going to be um, getting themselves organized to start putting uh, pieces together. Um, uh, we don't have a date yet, um, and uh, so when there's supposed to be kind of a launch meeting sometime in the next two weeks with the oversight staff, and I think at that time uh, we'll get a projected um, date for finishing it up. All right, thank you. I would Very like to mention there. it's a small thing, but our maintenance department has gotten excited about having the um, those little uh, toolkit um, stands that you can locate out in uh, the outdoors. And so they're putting five or six of those in various places on the Anacostia River uh, trail system. And uh, we are wrapping up our final comments uh, for the wayfinding sign system for the Anacostia uh, with our consultant. And um, so we hope to um, start moving that to procurement this spring and uh, then to construction. Thank you so much, Bob, um, uh, for those updates, uh, especially with the bridge. And I'm so glad that you guys uh, are enjoying um, bike repair stations. I believe that's what you uh, were mentioning um, on the trails. Um, My anyway. uh, new staff is also uh, uh, with uh, some staff in a different division are going to be uh, purchasing and installing about 20 trail uh, bike and pedestrian counters along the trail system. So uh, we're like Stephanie or Tiffany, um, long planned thing are uh, finally starting to uh, to move and it's helpful having more staff to keep multiple things moving. Um, Herb knows all about that. Uh, <laughs> Bob, that is excellent news. I'll be looking forward to hearing reports on on the counts at various times um, and getting a record on that. Um, well, um, it is about um, 8.35, 8.36. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for hanging in there. Um, thank you for our presenters. Um, and Bob, you always give us great information. Um, keep up the good work. Um, Seth, uh, Thank you for um, your advocacy and interest in Prince George's County, along with um, all the other folks that are here that are interested in what's going on and, get, and who give us their feedback. Um, have a great evening. And um, as Crystal mentioned, um, Irv, we will be getting the rest of the comments over to you. Hey, Mike. Yes. I'm sorry, this is Bong from the Department of Disability. Can I just make one quick comment or one quick suggestion to Irv? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so with your project and, and the development of all of the projects, um, I just wanna make a suggestion. I know obviously there's gonna be some ADA compliances to all of these projects, um, but when you mentioned outreach and then one of the uh, topics that you had mentioned was um, adding some floating bus stops. Um, I would strongly recommend that you do reach out to the disabled communities um, and the older age populations um, when you do your feedback um, for the public. Um, you know, floating bus stops are unfortunately a sore subject um, in that oh. community. <laughs> um, so getting input from people who actually are going out to the bus stops who have disabilities and are older age, um, I think would be really valuable to your uh, projects. Oh, I, I love that. Could you could you kindly um, email me some contact information? I'll make sure that we add that to our list of interested stakeholders. And uh, yeah, that's that's a wonderful recommendation. I appreciate that. 
Sure. Um, what I'll do is I'll put my email in the chat really quick. OK. OK, sounds good. We um, and that's also make sure we add you to the list. To share with our folks at our Office of Transportation, which handles our, our transit. And by the way, folks, while Tiffany was making her presentation, I did respond to all the remaining questions. Uh, take a look at those responses in the chat. Uh, Crystal, yes, kindly share that with me just to make sure I didn't miss anything. But I, I believe I did respond to all the questions. And most importantly, folks, if you want to learn about our project, make sure to reach out to me. I'll, I'll, we'll always be sure to call you back, but we do expect if people care, they reach out to us and um, we respond in a timely fashion. Your responsiveness along with Tiffany's and um, and Vic's is greatly appreciated. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're proud at the uh, County Planning Department to have you guys as our partners and colleagues. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, you all have a wonderful night. Thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. All right. Good, night. Good night. Good night.